It's time to begin. Um, welcome back to the uh, closing plenary session for our uh, fall 2011 meeting. Uh, I trust that you have had a very fruitful uh, day and a half since we gathered yesterday. Uh, certainly, I've had an opportunity to check out some wonderful um, breakout sessions, and uh, I've uh, heard a lot of um, a lot of very uh, positive comments about breakout sessions that others have attended and others have conducted as well. I also have been hearing, um, at least informally from a few of you, some um, considerable support for the restructured schedule with the extra round of uh, parallel sessions. And um, uh, I'm glad for that feedback. I would um, invite those of you who um, may have views on that that they haven't had a chance to share to keep them in mind uh, when you get our, um, our, our email with the uh, meeting evaluation in a week or 10 days. Um, uh, certainly it will be helpful to us to have that feedback in um, structuring future meetings. I don't have a lot to do before introducing our closing um, uh, plenary speaker, but there are a couple of things I do want to do. First, I want to remind you of the um, uh, list in your um, white registration packet of upcoming meetings. Um, in particular, our meeting uh, in April in Baltimore. I hope that we'll see many of you there. Um, next December, we will actually be back in the district um, for our December um, uh, um, for our December 2012 meeting. Gosh, um, that seems so far away and so soon too. Um, anyway, um, so we we have got the dates for all those set, and you can find them either in the in the packet or on your web uh, or on our website if you want to mark your calendars. I'd like to ask for a round of applause for the large number of people who came here and contributed their time and their insight in all of the breakout sessions. Uh, that really is the heart of this meeting and it is greatly appreciated. So let's thank them all. I'd also just like to take a minute to thank all of the folks who um, make these meetings run as smoothly as they do um, to uh, Jackie, Sharon, Angelo, Diane. Um, they um, have been, as always, a wonderful help in uh, making everything go smoothly. Thank you. And with that, let me move on to the uh, um, main reason we're here. You'll, you're going to hear this afternoon from Professor Bill Michener. Um, Bill is at the University of New Mexico. He is a scientist who's done a tremendous amount of what I would characterize as genuinely multidisciplinary work um, around the life sciences, the earth sciences, informatics, um, uh, exactly the kind of, um, of, of sort of creative synthesis and, and heavily um, uh, team-based uh, multidisciplinary work that um, I think uh, so well characterizes much of the 21st century scientific enterprise. Um, he is also the director of the NSF um, Data One project, which is their um, their flagship data net project. Data One is a very, very interesting project, which I've gotten to know a fair amount about as I've had the privilege of serving on their external advisory committee for the last um, 18 months or, or two years or whatever it's been. Um, and, and that's been a real 
wonderful experience because this is a project with a lot of moving parts and a lot of um, connections to other things. Um, uh, it's, it's a very strategic kind of um, uh, multi-piece project that's intended, I think, to um, complement and connect up with a whole range of other important initiatives going forward and to um, make the whole much more valuable than any of the um, individual parts. It also, I think, recognizes that um, this is not just about technology, it's really about culture and sociology and uh, changing consensus about practice and about relationships and um, interconnections. Um, and not just in a sort of a, um, a study it way, but a, a real build new institutions and new bridges kind of way. And um, I think you'll see that um, ideas, for example, about um, citizen science and citizen engagement run um, very um, deeply through some of the underlying thinking here. Uh, Bill has been just a wonderful leader for this project, shaping the vision and coordinating um, a small army of participating institutions um, uh, and leading them forward. Today he's going to, I, I think, do two things. Um, he's going to talk about the way science and higher education and research institutions are changing in the face of all of these developments. And then he's going to use that as a context to help us understand um, some of what Data One is hoping to achieve. So I think you'll find this to be a very thought-provoking and informative talk, and I'm going to turn the podium over to Bill. If you want biography, there's plenty of it on the net or in the book. Welcome, Bill. Well, thank you all very much. Um, all I have to say is, wow, this has been a great meeting. Uh, this is one of the I think maybe the only meeting I've ever been to where I've always wanted to be in two or three places simultaneously, and that's, that's quite difficult to do. Um, what I wanted to talk about were several things. One, some of the new paradigms, I think, that are shaping science and academia. And these are accompanied by some fairly significant challenges that we all face in our daily dealings. And then I want to introduce Data One for um, maybe about 20 or 30 minutes and talk about it and our approach for trying to deal with some of these challenges that I think we're uh, facing. And then I'll conclude with a few remarks about the future. So first of all, some of the new paradigms. I think we're entering uh, overall an era of grand challenges. And this can be interpreted as grand challenge science, grand challenge uh, uh, humanities, grand challenge scholarship, uh, you name it, I think it's a time of grand challenges for all of us. This particular graphic here indicates some of the real driving challenges in the environmental sciences, I think, that are facing us right now. Things like global climate change, uh, population redistribution and impacts on uh, water resources, and a whole array of things that have not only scientific impl implications, but some fairly significant uh, societal implications as well. And hence, um, one of the reasons I'll refer to them as grand challenge uh, questions that I think again will be dominating science for the next probably decades. Uh, this is indicated just even looking at the budgets of various funding agencies. Here I show the uh, 2012 budget for the National Science Foundation. And you'll notice that the major new investments there focus on three areas of what I would term grand challenge issues. One is clean energy and developing those new sources of energy that uh, decrease our dependence on foreign oil and so on, uh, as well as have less of an impact on the environment. Secondly, um, something called SEAS, which stands for Science, Engineering, and Education for Sustainability. And this is uh, roughly a billion dollar effort out of the next uh, 
federal year's budget that will focus on this particular activity. And this crosses virtually every directorate within the uh, agency of NSF. And then finally, cyber infrastructure for the 21st century, which will be uh, def um, essentially the information technology platform that will support those other two initiatives plus many other initiatives within the foundation. Um, I think a second paradigm that follows from this is that data intensive science is going to reign. And this is probably something that now I would be surprised if uh, there's not a single person in the audience that hasn't seen this uh, book cover from the fourth paradigm. But it, if you haven't, look at it as uh, really, I think, a game changer in the literature and the way that we uh, will be doing our science for the next few years. In particular, I think it leads to the fact that we're going to be searching for new ways and new tools and new ways of working uh, as we try to deal with these massive data streams that will be uh, heading our way. And that leads to sensors. Um, one of the things that I think is going to be driving this data intensive realm is the fact that uh, at the end of this year, probably we've already surpassed this, I've not checked the most recent numbers, but uh, it was projected that by the end of 2011, we would have over 1 billion sensors in the environment collecting data. Uh, and these would be from um, streams, atmospheric, earth science type data that uh, all of which help, can help address those grand challenge questions that I showed earlier. I also include in the lower right a picture of a human here because human observers also uh, represent key sensors in the field and they are the um, real genesis of what now is referred to as citizen science or public participation in scientific research. They also come coupled with their own sensors. Um, I think currently there's four billion uh, cell phones in the world, all of which have, many of which have GPS capabilities and other sensors associated with them as well. In addition, um, I think we are truly entering into an era where average citizens are going to become more and more involved in science. And one of the groups that I've been involved with now for several years is in the upper left. It's called eBird. Uh, but that's a group of roughly 30,000 active participants that contribute uh, bird checklists on at least a weekly basis. The actual number of individuals is much larger than that, but these are you know, the um, average number of really active participants. And this is growing on a daily basis because eBird just within the last six months, I believe, went international. So there's now the majority of the countries in the world now have an eBird citizen science program in their country. There are literally hundreds of citizen science programs out there. And I did um, just a quick search in the web and discovered these various logos here. But there's uh, probably an order of magnitude more citizen science programs that I'm not showing on this particular slide. Uh, one thing, if you are interested in this, we are holding our first citizen science workshop uh, or symposium that will be held this August uh, in conjunction with the Ecological Society of America. And we anticipate probably three to 400 participants of that, representing, again, this whole array of citizen science programs. Um, I think another element of this particular paradigm is the fact that teams of scientists are now having to work together to address these complex challenges. And the reason for this is that we're dealing now with problems that require us to work across multiple temporal, spatial, and thematic scales. And this is hard science. Most of us, as we were going through school, we focused on a fairly narrow subset of a scientific problem. And we didn't have to work across disciplines. We didn't have to worry about working across different scales of space and time. And uh, this, again, presents, I think, some real challenges as we try and do so. Increasingly, there are, there's instrumentation and support uh, for all of these different scales that I show. Uh, on the bottom, of clearly, we have a lot of data coming in through MODIS and other remotely sensed platforms. And then more recently, if you look at the top of the pyramid there, 
We have an increasing number of programs supported by the National Science Foundation in the U.S., as well as uh, similar programs and platforms internationally that are collecting very intensive data at a fairly small number of sites within a particular biome or region. The third paradigm shift that I think you are aware of as well is the fact that data for the first time over the last year or so are being recognized as valuable products to the scientific enterprise. And this is something that I've actually always found a bit troubling. Um, I, my entire career is, almost has been based on uh, soft money support through the National Science Foundation. And I know when you get to the end of a project you know, in NSF, what you submit is a project report that basically outlines the papers that you published and the graduate students that you supported. And there's little, um, little impact on other contributions that you may have made, such as data you created, software you produced, and so on. And that's all clearly changed in the last year through NIH, NSF, IMLS, and other uh, foundations and so on that are now insisting upon at least data management plans uh, be presented uh, as part of the proposal package. Dryad is one of our uh, member institutions in the Data One project. Uh, in this case, they recognize data as valuable contributions by providing digital object identifiers which show up in that yellow circle there. And they also provide in the lower boxes there recommendations for not only citing the publication, but also for citing the data as well so that contributors get credit not only for the work that they did in terms of producing a paper or a book or whatever, but also they get credit for the data that they curated and managed and published as well. Fourth, libraries I think are, are going digital. Um, I think it's a few years down the road before we lose all or most paper in libraries, but I foresee that coming. Um, and along with this, there's, I think, a big change in terms of how libraries are, are working. Uh, this is just one example of a project we're working on at the University of New Mexico that was recently funded by Tony Hillerman's daughter, as a matter of fact. And this is um, bringing together all of his interviews, manuscripts, drafts, uh, every piece of information about Tony Hillerman available so it can serve a particular scholarly community that is interested in his works and going back through and looking for connections and so on. And this is uh, just one example, I think, in terms of the, the types of activities or collections that libraries will be developing over the next few years. Um, in addition, libraries, I think, are going to be changing the way they look and feel and act. Um, we're going to see a lot more advanced infrastructure in libraries, things like visualization walls, collaboration spaces, and so on, areas where people can get to work and deal directly with uh, data and information uh, to help create knowledge within that particular environment. And we're also going to clearly going to see much more in the way of collaboration spaces. I know at our university, we're c continually shrinking down the volume of books that we have via movable stacks and other mechanisms to create more space for building collaboration spaces and adding in technology uh, areas. And then fifth, um, I think one other big change is the fact that uh, this ability to deal with data is going to become the new statistics. And we need to recognize that, and, um, and I'll talk more about this in, in just a few minutes. So those are the five paradigms, I think, that are accompanying this new era of grand challenge science or grand challenge scholarship. But there are also some uh, significant challenges that we face. This article here comes from uh, William Brinkman, who is uh, head of the DOE's Office of Science. And he argues, um, I think, very um, vehemently that we need to really push for federal support for basic research. And there's several reasons for this. One is that industry, commerce and industry, have largely uh, stepped back from a lot of the basic science support that they have done in the past. 
Uh, similarly, other institutions don't have the, the dollars and wherewithal to support basic scientific research. And he argues in his paper that, and I think we've all seen this, that support for science historically has been a bipartisan issue. And there has unfortunately been some partisanship enter into support for science and STEM education that I think all of us really need to fight as hard as we can. Another challenge um, that I, builds upon one of the previous slides I showed is that big science also again requires working across these different scales, but in our studies in Data One, and our interviews with subjects and communities, um, it's evident that currently most scientists are spending about 80% of their time dealing with fairly mundane data management aspects. And I, I refer to that and, and include in that things like uh, merging different data sources together, um, doing a lot of the manual documentation, a lot of the more trivial aspects of science, trivial in the sense from their perspective, in the sense that they would prefer to spend their time doing the analysis and interpretation of the data that they are collecting. So, you know, there's a real balancing effort that we have to play here. And again, scientists feel like a lot of their time is spent doing things that they, again, would uh, really have prefer to have automated or prefer to have other alternatives. This is from a paper I published back in 1997 that led to um, ecological metadata language, a metadata standard being created, as well as a biological data profile on the USGS. But it points to the fact that, you know, which I think is still true, and that is that we have a constant problem uh, associated with data entropy, and that is that you know, most of the data products that we produce in science they always continue to, to lose their value over time because we, we, we lose the understanding of what those data mean. We lose the context for why the data were collected. Uh, we lose information such as where the permanent plots were that we collected data from originally. A lot of the details associated with collection and analysis and so on. And over time, you lose enough of this information and that renders that data set meaningless uh, for reproducibility or usability, let's say, in a meta-analysis or a synthesis effort. So I would argue here that all of us need to really encourage and promote comprehensive metadata to the fullest extent possible so that, again, we can retain the meaning of the data products that we're producing. Another challenge uh, that we're faced with is, was pointed out by Jim Gray and others, and it really highlights the fact that there are a number of, a uh, small number of repositories that hold a tremendous volume of data. And this can include satellite data, the Aeros Data Center, for example, or GenBank, Protein Data Bank, and others that are widely recognized in the community, and again, hold tremendously large volumes of data, but on the other hand, most of the data sets are actually small, they're distributed, and they represent that long tail of the distribution, and they are often referred to as orphan data sets, again, because there's no repository to essentially watch over them and preserve them for the long term. So this is clearly an issue that I think we all are aware of and uh, need to deal with. And then probably what I think is one of the the most serious challenges that we face is what I refer to as stovepiping of data. And this happens through uh, the roughly five million plus data centers or that are, uh, have been enumerated worldwide. And these are uh, institutions that have, uh, again, like Protein Data Bank and GenBank that have uh, large volumes of resources and then the smaller smokestacks you see here from the London skyline representing those very small repositories that hold data, institutional or research project repositories, many of which are ephemeral in nature and all of which are disconnected from one another. So 
if you wanted to go out and identify all the data you needed to answer one of those grand challenge questions I showed on the first couple of slides, you would literally almost have to go to each one of these individual repositories and try and discover those data. And that's clearly an impossible task. So that leads me to data one and what we're trying to do about some of those challenges. And I'm going to introduce uh, four aspects to our project. One, <clears throat> the fact that we engage the community and have since day one. Uh, secondly, uh, we were really focused on building infrastructure, but only the infrastructure we feel it is required. And we're, again, not trying to reinvent the wheel. And then we're doing a lot of work with respect to education and outreach to the community. And then finally, I'm going to touch upon just our current status and the future of the project. So in terms of engaging the community, there are several ways we do this. Uh, one in the, uh, the, this young lady here who is a scientist that we interviewed, um, she represents one of 10 different groups that we call our st primary stakeholder community. These include environmental scientists, citizen scientists, decision makers, and so on. And we've developed scenarios built around these different stakeholders. And this has informed the infrastructure that we include in data one. And, in, and it covers such activities as how that particular individual or stakeholder spends their day. So how do they do their science? How do they collect their data? How do they interact with colleagues? Uh, all aspects of you know their daily professional life. We also collect uh, do a lot of stakeholder surveys, and I'll show results of one of those in just a minute here. Uh, in the lower corner, we do a lot of usability testing of our website or the tools that we're producing. And then in the upper right, we have other working group activities, which I'll talk about separately in a in another slide here in just a minute. So one of the um, first surveys we did was of the environmental science community. And this shows one of the key results of that, which I thought was surprising, uh, which is that 80 per, more than 80% of the uh, individuals surveyed said that I would be willing to share data across a broad group of researchers who use data in different ways. And this is almost the reverse of what I probably would have expected. But I think the scientific community really is waking up at recognizing that we have these really challenging problems and we do need to be more cognizant of our uh, responsibility for sharing data and exchanging data with others. This is in um, a paper by Carol Tenniper in 2011, published in PLOS One, if you're interested in the full uh, set of analyses. Also, as part of this, though, so this is sort of a corollary to it. Again, 80% of the scientists surveyed are willing to share their data, but they have challenges they're facing in terms of trying to do so. And most of them felt that they were, and this is just four problems they, that we identified. Um, in many cases, the one here, um, 35% of the academic scientists were satisfied with the established processes to store data beyond the life of the project. 40% uh, of academic scientists were satisfied with tools and technical support for data management during the project. 46% were satisfied with the tools for preparing their documentation. And then here's one that's really somewhat confusing in that uh, 62% of academic scientists said that they were satisfied with the process for cataloging and describing their data. But when you dig a little deeper into this, you discover that the majority of these scientists were using standards that they developed in their own laboratory. So these were not metadata standards that were broadly used in the community, but these were just scratch pad approaches they use in their own laboratory to document data, and they were quite happy with those. So uh, it doesn't do much for uh, data sharing, though. Oops. Uh, we're in the process now of, um, we have a survey for libraries and librarians out now, and we'll be soon surveying data managers, educators, and citizen scientists as well. 
hand. I'm not sure why. There we go. Let's try this. Um, I mentioned that we also use working group activities, and this is one that um, we created a working group that we not anticipate when we put the proposal in, and we call it Exploration, Visualization, and Analysis. And this is bringing a group of really top-notch scientists together, putting them in the same room and saying, okay, what's a grand challenge question that you all would like to tackle? And in this case, we had a very diverse group initially, and we identified three or four major grand challenge questions that uh, the groups wanted to tackle, but identified one in particular that we thought we would start with. And this was trying to better understand the uh, continental scale dynamics of bird migration. And this involved pulling in data from 31 different data sources, I only show four here. Uh, eBird, I mentioned that previously, so citizen science data played a key role in this particular study. Uh, interestingly enough, one of the data sets that we uh, discovered or needed was actually in an individual scientist laboratory in Utah, and we found out about it through word of mouth. So again, one of those challenges that we face when we're trying to do you know, these grand challenge uh, type questions. In addition, uh, we needed about 600,000 hours on the Terra grid to process the data. We needed a new statistical model for doing this. And we needed vis advanced visualization tools uh, as part of a workflow in order to support this. And what this is looking at in, is um, the indigo bunning. The white is the summer breeding territory. If you look over Atlanta, you might see a dark spot. That's a, then indicates the birds are actively avoiding metropolitan areas on their migration northward. But we did this for about 250 birds, uh, and this led to the State of the Birds report released by the President in uh, May of 2011. And it's serving also as the basis for future research as well, and literally dozens of publications that will be appearing in the scientific literature. Uh, one of the reasons we did this was to try and understand how scientists do their work, what the challenges are they encounter, and again, data discovery was a key one. Uh, the ability to uh, process the data, to get the data to that uh, 600,000 600, some hours of uh, computing time on the Terra grid, and then uh, incorporating all of that into a visualization workflow package. These were all challenges for the community and uh, again, helped drive some of the architecture that we are incorporating into Data One. We also have what we refer to as a Data One users group that provides an awful lot of feedback to us. They identify, for example, the tools that we incorporate into our toolkit, which I'll show in just a minute. Uh, they review essentially all aspects of the project and provide feedback and guidance to us. So that leads me to the cyber infrastructure component of the project. And our, our goal here was to enable new um, science and knowledge creation through the ability to easily discover and access data, as well as tools that can support different aspects of the uh, data lifecycle, which I'll show in a future slide. And again, we, we sort of started with three precepts. One is that we wanted to build on existing infrastructure. We didn't want to reinvent repositories that already existed. We wanted to build upon those. We wanted to only build some of the key uh, glue infrastructure that was necessary to support that interoperability or interworkability. And then third, we wanted to, to uh, support communities of practice and enable them to do new science. So our infrastructure is comprised of three components. Uh, the first and uh, underlying layer, there's what we refer to as member nodes. These are actually organizations, libraries, research networks, universities, federal agencies, and others. Um, they all hold data. Uh, they probably serve a particular community, and they probably have some kind of support services for that specific community as well. And they retain their own copies of the data, and they're worldwide. Um, there's a second component, which um, 
and the, the numbers here are indicative of what we included in the proposal initially, where our sites are actually much broader than just the small number of dots that I'm showing, but this is just to give you an indication. Uh, the second key component is what we refer to as coordinating nodes, and these are essentially that infrastructure we're building that is uh, essentially hosting all of the metadata from all of those individual data repositories at three different coordinating nodes, so there's 24-7 replicated metadata, and it's indexed and then easily searchable. And the coordinating nodes also provide other network-wide services as well, some of the security aspects, uh, the ability to replicate data across member nodes so that we have multiple copies of data stored in different locations, and so on and so forth. And then the third key component was one that we, um, again, had received input from the community, is that they wanted to see tools that were tightly integrated with the data one resources. So you could use a tool that you're familiar with, let's say Microsoft Excel or R or some other package, and you could then essentially mount data one as a drive, easily uh, discover the data that you want from data one, use those in analysis, and then potentially upload results to um, another repository. So these are the three uh, again, major components here. It shows uh, essentially a lot of the service interfaces that we're building for the member nodes and the coordinating nodes. We also support client libraries for developers um, that want to add tools to our toolkit. And these include Java, Python, and then we have a command line interface as well. And one of the things we did was we recognized early on the need to have a, a tiered implementation for member nodes. And we have, again, four different tiers here. The first one is read-only public content. The second is read-only with access control. The third is read-write. Um, and then finally, uh, the fourth and um, the highest level tier here is the ability to serve as a replication uh, node for other member node data. Uh, one of the things we do is we publish all of our architecture documents and so on on this website. Uh, if you go to there, you'll see roughly 500 pages of documentation. Everything we do is open source and openly available. Uh, this just gives you an idea of the diversity of member nodes that we're dealing with. Um, initially, the one on the left is the Oak Ridge National Laboratory Distributed Active Archive Center for Biogeochemical Bio Dynamics. Uh, it holds some fairly large databases. Um, they have a very high level of curation there. These data are all peer-reviewed, heavily peer-reviewed, and the data products are often used literally dozens of times for um, an array of different uh, analysis problems. And this is supported by NASA. I mentioned Dryad previously. Dryad allows you to publish data at the same time you publish your journal articles. And right now there are 30 some journals that are part of Dryad, including PLOS, which just signed on uh, just a few weeks ago. And then on the right is um, the one where there's, there's the, the least amount of enforced curation, but it's quite a popular uh, repository. It's uh, the Knowledge Network for Biocomplexity, and there are roughly 25 or over 25,000 data products associated with it now and a number of different metadata standards are supported in, in this particular uh, repository, and this has been supported by the National Science Foundation. And this just shows the growth of the uh, KNB uh, repository. Initially, it started out uh, a couple years of development there and some early adopters, and then we uh, started an extensive education campaign and then a number of large research networks like LTR and PISCO, which is a coastal ocean uh, research network, all signed on. And since then, the repository has been growing steadily uh, to, again, a fairly large size. So how does all this work uh, for a member node or a data repository? This shows the R1L DAC, and you know they've existed like this for close to two decades. Um, 
They've had their data collectors out collecting data and contributing it to the repository. They've had a user group community that has taken advantage of those data for, again, other types of analyses and synthesis efforts and so on. But one of the things that was a real attraction for the RNL DAC was the ability to connect up with data one. And in this case, they have uh, any of the ORNL DAC users then have access to data that are available through other uh, data that are part of the Data One system, as well as the tools that are part of the investigator toolkit. And the equally important is the fact that uh, these users in the bottom uh, here uh, from other different programs and so on, they can easily discover, more easily discover the data that are available in the ORNL DAC. So this is a real benefit to NASA, and it ends up being a win-win for everyone concerned. So this is the, right now, the, the group of uh, institutions that we're working with internationally to add in member nodes over the next couple years. Uh, we've hit most every continent, and we're actively, again, adding on lots of member nodes uh, with uh, some fairly significant con uh, content worldwide. One of the other um, key components is what we call our investigator toolkit. And again, this was the idea of providing tools that scientists are comfortable with using on a daily basis, and they want to integrate those more closely with the uh, data resources that they're uh, collecting as well. So we've, through our users group, prioritized a number of tools to add into the toolkit. Um, if you look under, I'll just go around the circle here real quick, uh, Microsoft Excel, R. These are some metadata management systems that are currently in use in different communities. Uh, discovery tools like Mendeley, Zotero, OneMercury, which I'll show in just a minute. Integration uh, tools like R, as well as some semantic tools that we're incorporating into our project. And then for analysis, uh, Kepler is a workflow engine. R again anal for analysis. VizTrails is the uh, visualization tool that I showed uh, on the BIRD project. And then MATLAB as well as another key uh, tool, again, that is widely used in the communities that we've uh, dealt with. Um, one of our partner institutions and a member of the Data One Network um, recently released uh, the DMP tool, which was under planning as part of that data lifecycle. And this has just taken off like wildfire, uh, probably exceeding everyone's hopes uh, and maybe even their desires. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's uh, an incredibly useful tool. Uh, I actually just used this yesterday to create a data management plan for a proposal I submitted to NSF, and it uh, worked like a charm. But this is a, sort of a wizard-driven type tool that steps you through the process of creating a very credible data management plan for any of the different programs or directorates at NSF as well as several other agencies that are now being added in as well. Uh, One Mercury is our tool that supports uh, data discovery. And it starts out, and I don't show the first slide here, but there's essentially a Google-like interface where you can type in one or two keywords. And this is the next uh, uh, page that pops up, which allows you to uh, do bounding boxes, uh, identify specific locations, put in temporal windows, and so on, and then hone in on the the uh, you know, the areas that you're uh, to hone in on the specific data that you're particularly looking for, and then you can go even further and apply through faceted search uh, different filters like uh, author keywords, originators. Um, uh, others can be easily added in, like uh, sensors, should that information be available, and so on. And then there's a relevance factor that you see here. It's the number of stars that, so depending on the keywords and all the search criteria you put in, you get a, uh, a listing of all the data uh, that may be relevant to your project, and then a relevance factor that allows you to look more closely. You can look at the, uh, you can view the metadata, and you can also then, um, if you like, again, if you see something that's quite highly relevant to what you're doing, uh, you may not be able to see this, but there's uh, another term here called find similar data. 
And this is where, again, we're incorporating a lot of our semantic tools into this to uh, really ease and um, make the search much more powerful. Uh, once you've discovered the particular data items that you like, you'll see a box up there where we've checked off three different data packages. And then you can incorporate those into your own particular library that you see in the bottom here. And these are all data packages then that you've collected via your search on through the data one uh, or one Mercury uh, tool. So you can build up very easily your own essentially a collection of data products that you can then take and work with. You can uh, take that next step in terms of meta-analysis and synthesis or uh, whatever your uh, research project leads you. Uh, one other element that we're working on, this will be in the spring release, is what we call OneDrive. And it'll initially be read-only, but um, this allows you to mount the entire Data One resources uh, as a drive on your own particular machine. So you can, again, very quickly search through uh, providers, keywords, projects, title, a whole array of different um, you know, search parameters, and do that on your local system. So education and outreach is another key component. Uh, one of the things we have started is a, a graduate program that we offer. This is a very intensive three-week course that we teach for environmental scientists. Uh, it focuses on informatics, uh, advanced analysis and visualization, and then geospatial analyses. And it's uh, essentially three weeks of, again, very intensive hands-on activities. And the students, uh, in go away with a, a, a real solid understanding of the, the tools they're using as well as the ability to actually put them into practice. And that's something that I think is clearly missing in a lot of our curricula these days in the environmental sciences, is a better ability to use those tools. Um, a couple other things we're doing in terms of trying to support the community are we have a couple databases I show on the top, what we call best practices. This is something also that would help anyone that's filling out the data management planning tool and has a question about, you know, well, what documentation uh, standard should I use? You can go to the best practices database here, enter in documentation or metadata, and it'll pull up a lot of information about that and help. Yeah. It's one pagers that will help uh, work an individual through, hopefully, and answer the questions that they have. Um, associated with that one pager, which hopefully answers the question, but there's also pointers to tutorials, additional resources like books and key journal articles and so on. The uh, DMP tool I just mentioned, and then we're actually working on the bottom here on uh, what we call learning modules. Uh, and these are modules that you can take and essentially incorporate them into lectures in your general biology, ecology, environmental sciences, earth sciences, courses, whatever. And the idea here is to really try and, and get um, informatics education to the domain sciences where it's really needed. And um, that's, I think, going to receive a lot of use over the next um, few, few years. We do a lot of Outreach to um, to uh, different groups, including um, let's see, I'm not sure why that animation is not working. Anyway, uh, we do a lot of outreach to societies where we put on training conferences. Uh, we have built some um, cartoons that uh, are, don't don't work really well. <laughs> <laughs> But they, if when they do work, they're, they're actually quite compelling and uh, step you through the process of different aspects of how to upload data to data one and so on and so forth. So we're in the process now. Any day now, uh, we'll be releasing our, doing our full-blown public release. We actually have a website up now. We've had one for several months uh, with some of the particularly education resources but the full-blown cyber infrastructure will be uh, released this month. Uh, and it'll look, the website will look a lot like this. We've had a lot of support from NSF, USGS, uh, in kind support from NASA, and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, and Microsoft Research as well. So this is what we're 
in the process of releasing right now, our developers are trying to uh, clean up the last couple little bugs and get things ready for uh, an imminent release. But we have a number of tools in the toolkit that will be uh, in as part of the first release. Uh, the client libraries are all there. That's to support the developer community. So again, if you're in a project and you've got developers, you can add your own tools to the toolkit. You can also probably develop uh, some of the interfaces needed to add yourself as a member node to the uh, Data One Federation. Uh, the member node software is uh, right now up and running for seven different member nodes, and then the coordinating node services are all in place. Uh, so again, we have our public release in December, and then after that, we're on about a 10-week development cycle uh, for new products and services that will release over this next year. So we'll be adding things like OneDrive in February, uh, VizTrails, that visualization tool will be available in April, and again, we have a, again, a whole array of tools and services we'll be releasing over the next um, several months. Um, as part of the uh, data net requirements, we follow a fairly tight project management schedule or project milestones. Uh, as you can see here, we're, we're basically hit, hit all of our targets and has exceeded some, uh, one of which was the amount of storage that we have available through Data One, which uh, we've already far exceeded our uh, expectations for the first several years there. So I present this as, um, as a way of sort of closing on this particular topic, but that is I've thought recently about how do we judge our success, and not only in Data One, but I think across DataNet and across probably lots of other cyber infrastructure projects in the room, and, you know, I've, I've sort of looked at how NSF views success and how various product, projects are viewed as being a success or not. And I would argue that in many cases, their metrics for success are off target. So um, I started really thinking about this, and I want to propose these as um, criteria for success that we could all use in judging how well our cyber infrastructure or information technology development projects are working. So first um, is how quickly can a scientist discover and acquire relevant data wherever they may reside? Again, I think that's one of those key challenges that we need to have some significant uh, progress made on in the next few years. Secondly, how much time is spent on mundane data management activities? Currently, again, I indicated that it was you know, you could argue that it's 80, 20, 70, 30, 90, 10, whatever, but far too much time right now is spent on fairly mundane activities. And can we switch that around and have it so that the scientist is spending 80 or 90% of their time doing the, the real advanced analysis and visualization and interpretation, which is, I think, where they get more intellectual uh, stimulation. Third, how fast can data be visualized, analyzed, interpreted, and published? Uh, again, this is all, I think, part of the daily life of a scientist. They, they live for publications and analysis and interpretation and uh, getting science done. So what are we doing to enable that and speed it up? Uh, can analyses and interpretations be readily reproduced by others? And are they transparent? Um, I think this is getting more and more play, particularly through things like climate gate and other uh, issues that we see in the news. But nevertheless, I think it's a key part of science that we seem to have forgotten over the last 40 or 50 years, and that is, you know, reproducibility is a, a key element of what, again, what science is all about. Five, can scientists readily discover and use the tools that they need? And in going around the country and talking with various groups, I mentioned a package like VizTrails or Kepler or Scientific Workflow or others that I know could really speed up uh, the process of science. And a you know, large portion of the scientists that I talk with aren't aware that these tools even exist. So we have a ways to go in terms of informing the community about tools that they can use that will really speed up their work and make science proceed much faster. Uh, six, how rapidly can a community mobilize to tackle a grand challenge question? 
And that's not only through support of the cyber infrastructure that I mentioned previously, but it's also through supporting the collaboration that's necessary, bringing different interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary scientists together virtually uh, in many cases to uh, support that work. And then finally, uh, do scientists feel that they are being properly rewarded for efforts devoted to data management and collaboration? And this is a real challenge now as we, again, focus on these grand challenge science questions that can no longer be tackled by an individual scientist and a graduate student in a laboratory, but they require collaboration with maybe three or four or 200 other scientists so how do they get credit and feel like they're being rewarded for investing that effort in those uh, types of uh, problems? So I want to conclude with just a couple comments. Again, I, I argue that we're in an era of, of grand challenge science, uh, grand challenge scholarship, grand challenge humanities, uh, whatever. I think it's all quite related. Um, science is becoming much more of a, a team sport uh, we're tackling bigger and more challenging and complex problems. Um, science, I think, is embracing the, the fourth paradigm, and we'll see more and more of that over the, uh, over the next few years. And this is true in the humanities and social sciences as well, where sensors now are playing a key role in understanding human population and decision making and so on. Third, data have value. Fourth, libraries are looking and acting and behaving very differently and will continue to do even more so over the next few years. And then finally, data management, I would argue, is the new, the new statistics. So how do we usher in this new era that I've described? Um, there are three activities I think that we can all in this room perform. First of all is to promote it. Uh, I think we need to get out there and really sell the fact that these grand challenge questions require a new way of doing science. So we need to embrace interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, collaborative, and data intensive science. And we can do that through a whole variety of different means, but one I think that's really key is bringing awareness to those issues. Um, one area that I think deserves really active thought is collaboration. Uh, working together as teams and projects. And that's something that academia, I think, has been really uh, want to do in the uh, last, you know, in, in terms of, in, as far as I can remember, there have been very few efforts to actually focus on, you know, how do you bring, let's say, a group of undergraduates or graduate students together and work as a team on a, on a problem and share your expertise. And that's, I think, the direction that we're heading. Education, um, you know, we have probably in this room uh, dozens of different library and information schools represented, but is that solving the problem? I would argue no, it's not. Uh, we need to really inculcate uh, education into the domain sciences as well. So it's really key not only to have graduate programs in library information sciences, for example, but also to really get informatics into basic biology courses, basic anthropology courses, you know, all of the different uh, domains and disciplines. And then third um, is advocacy. And I think we need to advocate on several fronts. One is for new funding, and uh, the article I showed by the uh, Chief of Science, the Head of Science for the Department of Energy, I think is indicative of the challenges that we face with respect to garnering public support for basic science and applied science research. But we need to, again, clearly advocate for that. We need to work with the citizenry and get out at every moment. Uh, how many of you have spoken before a Rotary Club or a school or some other group that is non-traditional? Anyone? I see a few hands. That's, that's how you have impact, you know, is to get out and spread the word to the unconverted. You know, here I feel like I'm preaching to the choirs. So <laughs> I'm not sure how useful that is. Um, but we also need to advocate for uh, breaking down a lot of the barriers to this new way of doing science. And 
That includes academic barriers, uh, one of which is the tenure promotion system that rewards uh, stove piping and focusing on your own single uh, small area of research with your own first name, author, publications, as opposed to working on teams. Uh, just recently, I had a discussion with um, an individual that was weighing uh, whether or not someone was going to be promoted uh, in an academic department in my university. And he was really concerned because this particular scientist had chosen to publish his work in open source journals like PLOS, uh, which, you know, clearly a horrible place to publish. Uh, secondly, they had chosen to do all their research and publish it on open notebook. And, you know, again, there was, there was this view of uh, openness and sharing and, you know, doing things through uh, open source literature is, uh, had a negative connotation, which I was really shocked to hear. But uh, we need to break that perception down. And then funding silos, I think, are also key. And this applies to uh, foundations uh, of all ilks. And the, again, many of the, the challenges that we face, they are, they are much broader than any one program at NSF, for example, or uh, the Mellon Foundation. You know, they cross different uh, floors within the NSF. They cross different programs supported by different private foundations and so on. So we need to break down those barriers and make it possible to support, again, research that will confront some of those grand challenge questions that I showed previously. And I just want to acknowledge my team here. Uh, these are the people that have been essentially with me for uh, close to four years now when we first were, uh, wrote our initial pre-proposal um, and they've uh, stayed with us for weekly phone calls and it's been a real joy to work with each and every one of these folks. And this represents um, about a quarter of our or less of our uh, workforce. We have a lot of our other work is done through working groups and there are several people in the audience that are part of those working groups that I don't mention, but we appreciate the working group efforts as well. So uh, I'm available to be contacted any time if you have questions and also I think we probably have time for a couple questions now as well. And I see uh, at least a couple mics over here which you might want to take because I, my hearing is not the best. Thank you, Bill. How is Data One dealing with the long-term sustainability of data problem? Um, let's see, the, the problem is a long-term problem, and I don't think we have to worry about sustaining it. <laughs> I think what you meant was how we're we dealing with long-term sustainability of Data One. And, that's a tougher question to answer. We're, we're looking at a variety of... <laughs> well, we'll be talking about this some more in January. <laughs> but, um, we've been looking at a number of different approaches there, uh, some of which involve um, potentially membership, some of which might involve fee-for-service type activities. Um, another one is, I think, foundations and so on including NSF, are probably going to realize the, that they have a role in this as a key stakeholder in supporting data, not only in repositories, but also infrastructure like Data One that makes it more accessible and also supports replication and other activities. So I think we're probably going to see somewhat of a change in mindset as we all, as part of data nets and interops and other projects, you know, step through the process that you have to consider as part of building a business plan, and that is who are the stakeholders, who are the beneficiaries, and environmental scientists, in this case, are beneficiaries. Uh, the public is a beneficia beneficiary of this. Funding agencies benefit from having their data more uh, easily exposed, more readily exchanged, and so on. So I would argue that, you know, we have to look at, again, who benefits 
and then what the value is to them, and then present a case uh, via proposals, uh, membership fees, whatever, to the appropriate parties, and have an open discussion with them about, you know, what do you think your role is in this? And I think that's where we're, we're going in data one, and we're actively engaged with NSF and USGS and others in terms of this dialogue right now. So I can't answer specifically, but we have a lot of ideas that we're working on as part of our business planning. Uh-oh, I'm getting ready to get nailed here by McKinsey. This is an easy one, <laughs> low ball. Um, you mentioned one of the mundane data management tasks that researchers hate is the data integration, right? Integrating data from lots of data sets from different sources. And uh, I think in your grand challenge example, there were many tens, if not hundreds, of data sources. OK, and then in the toolkit, you mentioned one that kind of fits in that space other than just R, some semantic toolkit. But you know, in my experience, this is a really hard problem, right? Mm -hmm. So is this something Data One is really seriously tackling? How do you see that fitting into your strategy? And where do you think that activity should sit in the future, given how hard it is to do and how much domain expertise you need? And Dot, dot, dot. Right, that's, that's a great question. And we are working on it hard, but we're doing it with partners. And one of the, we have, I mentioned, and I didn't, I should have shown this in my org chart, but we have 10 working groups that are part of Data One, and they're all as, associated with different problems, citizen science, security issues, and so on and so forth. And one of the working groups is focused on semantics. And we have about a dozen individuals associated with that. It's led by Deborah McGinnis and uh, Jeff Horsberg, and we have Carl Lagozzi and several other members of that working group. And what they bring to the table is their um, integration with other NSF-supported projects that are focused on developing ontologies and semantic mediation tools. And our goal and is to, this year, to release some semantic tools that will be added into the coordinating nodes, the search engine in particular, that will help out with the data discovery part of it. So again, that doesn't get to the integration. That's a little bit more difficult challenge. Uh, we're working with a couple other projects. One in particular is called Sonnet, and it's led by Mark Schildauer out of the University of California and several others. And it's focused on developing an observation ontology. and. This is one, an area where I think we can have some impact in the next couple of years uh, to support integration. And you know, most of the types of data supported in the environmental sciences are based on some kind of an observation, either through a sensor or a human observer. And they have characteristics like spatial location. Uh, maybe they use some kind of a plot that had a square meter plot or a, square foot plot or whatever and you know one of the issues you want to be able to do is where you've got observations that are similar in nature you want to be able to easily do those conversions so take a square meter plot and convert that to you know a you know, square foot plot or whatever and that's just a very simplistic example in terms of what we're dealing with the real challenges that are going to be driving this whole area of research for the next decade are in the individual domain ontologies. And that's where you end up with problems like uh, wave height. You know, if you deal with uh, you know, an ornithologist that was involved with the eBird project, for example, wave height means something some different to them it's, you know, in terms of bird songs as opposed to an oceanographer who views wave height, again, as something very, very different altogether. So we end up with, at that scale, we end up with problems across all of these different domains where people use the same terminology for very, very different things. And that's where we have to have that context built into the, you know, the, that semantic mediation as well. So that's a lot more challenging issue that, um, you know, again, will be I think keep a lot of us busy for the next decade or so. And I don't think we see any more questions. Thank you so much. And I think Cliff is going to polish all the questions.
Thanks so much for that, Bill. Um, I do hope that uh, you will stay in touch on this. You've got a tremendously ambitious agenda, and um, I know I speak for many of us um, in uh, hoping that we can follow your progress in coming years uh, as you work on these. I think that we are at the end of the program. Uh, it remains for me simply to thank you for coming, to wish you safe travels home, a uh, good holiday season, and uh, everything uh, for a successful 2012. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>